Our text again this afternoon will come from the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes, and we'll read several verses, verses 6 through 13, verses 6 through 13. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. And this have I seen and applied to my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There's one thing that you can always count on if you look at the news at the beginning of each day, or really any time during the day, but I think about the beginning of the day, is just how much wickedness there is in this world, the various forms that it takes. You see, innocent people, and we think especially of children, babies, and infants, who are subjected to, who are subjected to all kinds of horrible treatment. And you see so many people who are simply going about trying to earn a living, and yet they are set upon by wicked thieves and, thieves and murderers and various things. And all of that goes on, especially around a big city area like Houston, but it's all over the country. And that's part of facing the reality and learning how to live here on earth and yet still live on earth in such a way as to please God. But the question that often arises, especially among those not acquainted with God's Word and not understanding why earth is here and why we're on it, is the question of why. Why does this happen? Why couldn't these things be stopped right now? The atheist likes to use what he calls the problem of evil to try to say, well, there's no God, and if he were good, then he would stop it. And if he doesn't have enough power to stop it, then what kind of God really is he and he won't? Well, they don't understand things except from the standpoint of time and space and material things. They cannot conceive that as far as God is concerned, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. And that he has a scheme worked out. And as I said this morning, life in the flesh on this earth and as long as time and space goes on is meant to be a place to get ready for heaven now could God have created another place that would have worked differently to get us ready for heaven and we could say why does he want us to get us ready for heaven what is all this had to do with well, some things we don't know there's one thing we know I'm here and you're here and we're in the flesh and we're subject to the frailties of the flesh and we have to live here till we die or the Lord comes back first it's not a matter of what if and what if. It's a matter of what is right now as we live on this earth in the flesh, regardless of age. And we see all sorts of things around us being blamed for the evil that exists. You see guns being blamed. You see 
drugs being blamed. And of course, I see it more, and it's really grown in my lifetime, all kinds of um, psychological problems being blamed. Have you noticed, maybe this is just me, but it seems like if you're considered, quote, normal, unquote, then you're the one that's abnormal. That everybody has some sort of plague upon them. That there's some sort of um, mess up emotionally or people falling apart psychologically and nobody can face life. I used to hear preachers preach back when I was a young person and they would be dealing with anxiety and what the Bible teaches about getting rid of anxiety and why faithful Christians shouldn't be anxious and all these things. And they would call it the aspirin generation because that's what people do. Take two bare aspirin and you get rid of your headache or whatever. I don't know what they call it now. I did hear a preach later on talk about the Valium generation. I don't know what they call it now. I guess uh, multiplicity of drug generation. <laughs> about anything you want. But when the further people get away from God and the belief in God and obedience to that divine standard of truth that is the New Testament, the more they're going to have every kind of imbalance under the sun the more they're going to feel tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and slide of men whereby they lay in cunning craftiness to deceive. That's just the way that it's always been with men as they go away from God. Read and believe Romans chapter 1, giving you a picture of the Gentiles not desiring to retain God in their knowledge and where they went when they gave up God. We sometimes forget at one time everybody knew God, everybody believed in Him, everybody obeyed Him. Well, that means somebody had to leave. Somebody had not to want to, to have anything to do with Him. And when you don't want to have anything to do with God, you're not apt to want to have anything to do with His Word, which is how He teaches us how we ought to live, and we don't want to be responsible to God. Nowadays, all you can hear is, don't judge me. And they don't mind telling God that. They can't handle it themselves, or they can't deal with evil itself. And they don't really want any kind of solution that still heads off them fulfilling and gratifying the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And so it's just on and on and on in a vicious circle. If you look back in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, things... Uh, had gotten so bad, and it's not, not the only time that that happened, and it can, has happened and will happen again. In Psalm chapter 10, or Psalm 10, however you want to say it, we've got this brought out by the psalmist, and it deals with this very point I'm trying to make. And that has to do with blaming everything, and they actually blame the problems on God himself. Notice how the psalmist writes. Speaking to God. Why standest thou far off, O Lord? Why hadst thou thyself in times of trouble? That's the way some people think. They're, God, in their minds, God is not acting as I think God ought to act. He's not relieving things right now as I think. One of the biggest problems we face in dealing with real evil is we don't accept God's way of getting us able to face reality, and that would be to face evil, things done contrary to God's will. Notice parents for many years always want to make it very easy on their children. They don't want them to have to face this. They don't want them to have to face that. They don't want them to have to struggle here. They don't want them to have to struggle there. What did God do? Remember, God loves you more than you can understand what love is. God made us with the power of choice and gave us the opportunity to choose. And look what a mess we made out of it. And he let us do it. That tells us something about God's love that we've messed up all around. Well, we hear it talked about in the last many, many years how parents do not know about tough love. Well, all that is, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what God said. The conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep His commandments. Is that the conclusion of the whole matter in the minds of people today? Fear God and keep His commandments? 
Certainly not. So people blame everything but themselves when it comes to evil. And certainly evil, that which is contrary and opposed to God and His will, doesn't just float around. It's not, it's not like COVID. <laughs> it doesn't just blow on its wind. People are evil because they do contrary to God's will. Their mind set on evil continually, one place says. They do evil. Evil spreads because people spread it. People live evil lives. How would you describe Adolf Hitler or Stalin? How would you describe those fellows? This sweet as little lamb? And yet I promise you that they dealt kindly with some people. Which tells me even very wicked and evil people have different times that they do good to people. But their whole life is not good. So wicked people can do some good things, but their whole life set upon evil. What does that mean? They're against God and they're against God's will. And they're upholding that which is against both. So you get all these things being blamed. People don't seem to understand, and having read psychology considerably, there are even psychologists who are not Christians and are not programmed with the truth of God, but they've looked at things. I guess you'd say they're more of philosophers in psychology than anything else. But they come to a conclusion that you have the obligation to struggle against what's bothering you to overcome it. I sound like uh, anything in the Bible about living the Christian life? That sound like take up your cross and follow me? This life's perfect for what God made it to be. He gives us His Word. He shows us His love. He proves His existence. He proves His love. And the devil, through the lust of the flesh, lust of the pride of life, and the way things work in this world, says don't pay any attention to that. And thus all these things get blamed rather than where the problem really is. And all these things become a rallying point, at least for the moment, of those who want to make changes. It really doesn't matter what's changed, just as long as changes are made. Have you ever noticed that about a lot of folks in the last 50 years? Let's change from doing it this way to that way. I remember back as a teenager, the big thing was, well, all we do in the worship is we have two songs, a prayer, a song, the Lord's Supper, a song, a sermon, and an invitation song. It gets boring. And thus, somebody in the denominational world wrote about that time where you're going to church and loving it less. <laughs> I bring me into the worship assembly and my attitude toward God and my knowledge of God's will is brought into this assembly. And I come here, if I come for the right reason, to worship Him and His will be done in worship. Not to satisfy me. But that's not the attitude of this country. It has been for a long time. And it permeates even, especially the denominations, but even into the church. And you see that. So we've got to change for the sake of change. We can have four songs. We have one song. That's fine. But all those things have to do with what expedites the whole of the worship service. It's not a matter of change for the sake of change. I wouldn't know what to think when I was doing a lot more travel than I am now. Just imagine, I go off, I go to the Far East, and I stay for a couple of weeks to come back. Jody meets me at the airport, and she's hired a brass band to meet me. And it's playing, you know, Welcome Home or whatever. I don't know what it play. Well, the next time I'm gone, say I went over to Russia, and I come back after a couple of weeks, and she's got a circus out there to Meet me. And on and on that kind of stuff goes. Change for the sake of change. You, it'll get old if you do it the same way very often. And the Bible's saying differently. Do what is right from the heart and do it all the time and never quit. There's variations, but we're in a world that likes change for the sake of change. Why change if you don't need to? If it expedites, then use it to expedite. If something better comes along that expedites the obligation, then use it. But why have an attitude that just change for the sake of change and that's going to make it all better? You see these little kids and they mash their finger 
say, come here now, kiss it. One of them told Jody not long ago, said, that's not going to make it any better. It doesn't. Why do we do it? Well, we're, we're like that. We're like that in all of our lives if we don't watch out. Because we've been raised where mom and daddy's hovered over us. I can't let this happen. They've got to have the best. Got to have this. They've got to have that. And I've got to raise them to think they're the best folks on earth. And what does that mean they're going to, if they think that, what do they, what do they think about other people? They're not. And they grow up that way, and you get a whole society of people thinking, me, 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 me. So no wonder then you have a, a cartoon fixed where the, <laughs> where the seagulls are flying over going, me, 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 me. Everything's me. And if you look at some of the ads on television right now, they're trying to tell you that what's wrong is that you don't pay enough attention to yourself and your worth and what you ought to be. And the Lord's saying, he that be greatest doing you, let him be your servant. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so how does the Lord exemplify that to his apostles? In a very menial, lowly fashion that only a slave did. He washed their feet. Well, that's not what kings do. He took nasty feet and washed them and taught us about those things. That's not what we do. No, you got to be, everything's got to be so-so. You've got to have the best computer. You've got to have this and uh, you know, you're deprived and you'll be hurt forever if you don't have a cell phone. And that's where we are. Not many years ago, we thought it crazy to supply a cell phone to our kids. We do now. Got to have it. Can't get along without it. You see how much we contribute to these things? Well, we walk. We, somebody says we slip into it. No, we line up and march in. But there is evil. And God exists, and there is evil. And the person who's an atheist, God does not exist, I know it, and I can prove it. Which most of them want to believe that, but they don't really like to come out and say that, especially put their money where their mouth is, the old saying goes. But evil's here, and as a child of God, I've got to deal with it. But watch this, let's reverse the argument. If evil is so prevalent, why is there one righteous person on this earth? Why are there those, why are there those that do righteousness if evil is so prevalent? And if we are a product of our society which is full of all kinds of evil, where do good people come from? And what is it to be good? Remember, the rich young ruler said to Jesus, Good Master, what must I do to hear eternal life? Well, Jesus, as he did so many times, turned around and said, Why callest thou me good? There's what one good, and that is God. Which is implying that if you call me good Master, what are you acknowledging about me? That I am God. Whatever is good comes from God. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variable that's neither shadow of turning. Whatever is good comes from God. And it can overcome evil, and it's the only thing, that, only thing that can overcome evil. So where does righteousness come from? Righteousness can't be evil. Evil can't be righteous. What we see is that one extreme does not preclude the existence of the other. Did you get that? One extreme does not preclude the existence of the other. Well, somebody said, wait a minute, now God's omnipotent. All power flows from Him, and whatever is powerful, He has. Well, there's an assumption here. That limitless power as it fits into God's essence means absolute control. That's not true. And it means a dictatorship. After all, that, uh, I guess you'd say that's, that's what men typically do with power, isn't it? But the power God offers is totally different. And that's the reason the gospel is God's power into salvation. Look how different it is from the way men approach things. Now, where do you think the line should be drawn? Stopping murder? 
stopping thieves, stopping rape, stopping adultery, stopping covetousness, stopping lying? Or should he draw the line at murder and let the rest of it go on? It's like Brother Warren asked uh, Flew, what would God really have to do so that you could say, I know there's a God? The fact of the matter is, he didn't want to know there was a God. Because God's done all of it that would appeal to any honest, rational person to be adequate evidence that he is. Now, could God create a place where there's no evil? Well, yes, he could. And in preaching the gospel, I'm glad to tell about it. It's interesting that just before inspiration quit in closing the book called the Bible, and especially the New Testament, we have this statement made in Revelation 21, 25 through 27. And the gates of it, speaking of this place, shall not at all shut, shall, shall be not shut at all by night. Well, there should be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Can you make a place where there's no evil whatsoever? No influence of evil? Yes. But you see, all these people wanting to do it their way, on their timetable, from a physical standpoint, and we're all limited by time and space. They don't realize this life in the flesh is a schoolroom. God through the Bible teaches us. The devil supplies the test as to we love God and have faith in Him and His system of salvation more than this present world. This short life where we must battle evil qualifies us or disqualifies us for entering into eternity in heaven or hell. It comes down to the fact that God chose to make men with free will but preventing a bad choice means there's no choice parents ought to remember that your vegetable choice for tonight's meal is broccoli or broccoli which do you prefer I know what used to happen when I grew up and I can't see hardly how it was mama cooked supper and it was set on the table and nobody says I don't like this Daddy took care of things like that after Mama did. God in His infinite power chose to make men with the ability to choose, and that includes the ability to make bad choices. That's the reason this is a, a situation that says, you show to God by your actions whether you want to go to heaven or not. Seems like to me, that's pretty wise. Well, could He have done it another way? That is a moot point. That's the reason I said a moment ago, we're here in this fleshly body, either young or old or growing old, or, and this is the way life works. Now, what are you going to do about it? Sit there like a knot on the log and pretend everything, you know, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Life is but a dream. No, it's not, unless you're a new ager. But isn't God the protector of the innocent? Certainly. Psalm 72, 4, God promises justice to those who, who harm children. But see, we want Him to do it right now because we can't see beyond right now. We're limited. We don't see God saying, well, the days with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. And, and yet the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord's not slack concerning His promise, the second coming of Christ, the end of the world as some men count slackness, well then why does all this continue on? Well, we are held in place by time and space and material things. It goes on so we will learn to make the right choices, love God and keep His commandments. Man's been pretty bad about not doing that. So by, the implication is that when harm is done, God in response sees the proper justice is done. And He will, but not on my timetable. Because he's concerned about you and every other single solitary individual alive on this earth. Now, how many is that? We look in the news and you see all these people in India and China and Africa. Let me tell you something. Americans, Christians, God loves them just as much as he loves you. And Jesus died for them just as much as he died for me. 
and he's concerned about their salvation, even when his church in America may not be. You think God loves you more than he loves that little black starving baby in Africa or a little child down in Indonesia? In Indonesia? He loves all of us the same. So time goes on and the way things work here to give man a chance as a free moral agent to learn the truth and obey it. He's not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish. Well, how many is left out if he's not willing that any should perish? But all come to repentance. So God's on his own timetable. And you know, I just believe God knows how long this world ought to go on. He'll know when to call it quits. I even believe that about my life and your life. Do you? I believe God knows me in and out, upside down, every way it's possible to be known that I don't even maybe know myself. He knows how long I'll stay here. And he knows how long you ought to stay here. But evil people exist, Psalm 10, 7 through 10. And why? Ultimately, they reject God, Psalm 10, 2 through 6. But then why, again, should the innocent suffer? Well, why doesn't God prevent the consequences of sin? He did, he did promise to protect from evil, Psalm 121. Well, consider this. Is it murder if you shoot knowing that no one will ever be harmed? If I just pulled out my AK-47 and go, okay, now let's turn over to, to uh, what's going to happen if I were to do that? Somebody out there is, is probably not going to make it. But you see, people want a world where all that's wiped away. You take a baby that's crawling, because of the laws of nature, it finds it a bobby pin that goes over here to an electrical outlet and it pokes it in there. Is it just right? What's going to happen? I don't care how innocent it is. And it can't be anything but innocent. Could be killed, couldn't it? You take a journeyman electrician or a master electrician and he slips up and hits the same thing. What's it going to do to him? He knows better. It's going to do the same thing to him because he violated the law of electricity. Now, what would we be if we were in a world where there are no laws? No laws. No laws of anything like that. No natural law. No, no laws of physics, Keith. You wouldn't have a job. No laws of physics. How would you work? What would you teach if there are no laws of physics? <laughs> what would any of us teach when it comes to nature without laws that govern all these things? The world basically would be one big video game where you sit down there and you just get into all sorts of battles, blow tanks up, blow people to smithereens, and you just turn the game off, start over, because you're tired of it right now. No law would be broken, would it, if life was nothing but a video game? What kind of people would we be if we were protected from all harm by others? How do children turn out when parents protect them from bad grades? I've already introduced that. Bad choices, etc. There's a very uh, philosophical term that you apply to kids who are smothered like that. Brats. Please ask these 8 11. It's all got to be done my way when I want it. I think I told you some years ago, this is quite a few years ago. I parked over here and I was waiting for something. It's been so long ago I've forgotten, but I was across from a pharmacist. And I heard this racket, and I, I looked out, and there was a mother, I suppose, at least it was a woman, caregiver or somebody, trying to get a boy, looked to be about 13, 12, or something like that, in the back of the car, and he wasn't wanting to be in the back of the car. And when I saw him, the whole car was doing this, and that boy had that woman, one handful of hair on this side, one handful of hair on that side, and he was giving it that. And, you know, it's hard to restrain myself, but I wasn't about to get mixed up in that. I thought, well, if she ain't got any better sense than that, she needs as my grandmother used to say, snatch ball headed. You know, sometimes we get from our children just exactly what we made them to do. 
And if we create them to where they think everything ought to go their way, have we really prepared them for life? Strange as it may seem, without consequences, guess what? People become more wicked. Look at our nation. And if we do not face hardships or have them to overcome, then we don't make the choices that improve us. So God made a world perfect to get us ready for heaven if we honestly receive with the weakness the engrafted word, govern ourselves by it, and take up our cross and follow him and suffer here on earth and mold a character in the likeness of Christ that will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant someday. And the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 5 through 8, talked about God loves those, and if he loves them, he chastens them. That's the way we grow and develop. Hardships, grief, the fighting against evil, bring out the best in people. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Write it down. Go look it up and read it home. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, as well as Romans 5, 3 through 4. Look at boot camp. Ask me if they undergo any hardships, and they're training them so they can hopefully keep them alive when they fight the enemy. As one fellow told me in World War II, said his old drill sergeant said, you don't like the way we're treating you? Said, we don't not going to treat you at all as bad as the Japanese or Germans are. And we better think about that. The whole world knows that what was done was evil. And people are now making choices as a result to reject evil. Because even in the presence of evil, God produces good. Romans 8, 28. Think of Christ. The Bible says he went about doing good. What did they do to him? He was crucified. Tormented before he was crucified. He even said the foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. Who created all of this? Who was the executor of the Father's will in creating everything as you read of it in Genesis before man's sin? Jesus. Even the gunmen recognize where you have these people killing innocents. Those gunmen recognize what they did was wrong, and many of them know it's wrong because many of them try to kill themselves afterwards. <laughs> Why do you do that? Why does anybody want to kill himself? That always prove a thing, but it shows they have no idea of life. And they're totally messed up in their own minds about their own lives. So God did not promise life without tragedy and grief. But he can offer comfort. And he's the only one that really can in the face of tragedy. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. And we get so upset at what happened that we forget who's to blame. God makes people upright. Every one of us and every human on this earth was born an innocent child, not guilty of sin. But we forget that we have all sinned, and there's where sin enters the world, or evil enters the world. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. And the innocent are murdered, Ecclesiastes 7.9. God teaches men to live righteously. He's the one who said, Thou shalt not murder. He's the one who said killing the innocent was an abomination, Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. So it's the evil person against God, against God's laws, who rebel against him, who ignores God, Jeremiah 22 and verse 17. The evil deceives himself into thinking that God does not care, and I've already cited Psalm 10, 11. But God does care. But you have to tune in to God. You see, I, I know this is the problem. I see it and experience it, and I read it in the Bible, first of all. Life is a contest of wills. It'll be either our will be done or God's will be done. And until we wholeheartedly and completely say God's will be done in every area of my life, then the rest of that life we're trying to keep and reserve to do as we please with, and God will not be served with reservations. So we need to put the blame where it belongs. 
people who do evil or against God, and they're going to treat other people in a bad way. Let's stop blaming others and things and so forth and see what we need to do. That's how we're the leavening for good in the world. The light of the world is to do good. So we need to examine how to teach people to choose good over evil. And we won't isolate ourselves from evil, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, 36 through 43. We will learn how to deal with it without embracing it. We will learn how to show the way of righteousness and expose the error. Because that's what Jesus did. In every example of a godly man, he always did the same thing. At times, finding a good man as the Bible defines good is a hard thing. Micah 7, verse 2. We are taught in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 to act like men, to be mature, to be strong, to choose what's right even when it hurts. And we should abhor evil, everything against God and His Word in this world, Romans 12, 9, and call men out of it. And yes, we have the obligation to defend those who are weak and cannot defend themselves, Isaiah 1, 16 through 17. When I think of an unborn child, it should be in one of the most secure places it will ever be, and it's in one of the most dangerous places it can be today. Justice will come. So even if the world has lost its fear of God, Psalm 10, 12 through 18, we need to point out that the wrath of God is yet to be revealed against all unrighteousness. And He will do it at the right time. I don't have all the detailed answers for all the little things that might come into your life. You'll have to take the truth of God's will and honestly apply it all day long, every day, every second of the day. And answer whatever comes your way with a thus saith the Lord. And sometimes you say, I don't want to go that route even though I know there's nothing wrong there. It's just not a wise thing to do vis-a-vis -vis the sermon this morning. And so if you're a coney, look for rocks. And if you can't protect yourself, get in a place that can. That's wisdom. The time to do battle is here. Now, train your people to do battle. Train yourself to do battle. And we're called soldiers of the Lord. And we're to put on the whole armor of God. We're in the midst of the greatest battle that will ever be on this earth. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And let's just say it this way, all evil in heavenly places. That's what we're fighting against. Ideas that are wrong. Philosophies that are against God. Religions that are contrary to the Bible. And then doing good in the midst of all of that, as the Bible says, be ready into every good work. And training our children and one another to face the hard realities of life with a thus saith the Lord and patience and letting God have His way with us and not us running ahead of Him. This is the second part of my New Year's sermon. <laughs> but I think you can use it all day long every day of however long you have left because it's just about what we're here for. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to obey the gospel as a child of God if you need to repent we urge you to do that while we have time and we urge you to do it now while we stand and while we sing